Okay, hello, hi, howdy, no. I'm very used to filming TikTok videos where I can see myself, um, and so this is a bit of an adjustment for me and maybe for you if you've been familiarized with me and my content before. If not, hi. Also, I'm aware that the ring light in the glasses might be distracting. Unfortunately, I'm visually impaired and there's nothing we can do about this setup, okay? Uh, recently I thought to myself, there just aren't enough people on the internet discussing Dutch Vanderland and it seems like a really untapped content market, so... To rectify that, I've locked myself into hours worth of gameplay uh, to hyperanalyze Dutch Vanderland's every move. Um, and no, these notes are not indicative of a problem, they are indicative of passion. Any Red Dead player could tell you that Dutch Vanderland is unwell and there's been quite the debate over when that started, so much so that I feel like skipping all that and getting right into why is he like that? There are many popular theories online ranging from schizophrenia to traumatic brain injuries, but I'm rather partial to my theory. Um, it's bipolar disorder. That's a manic man, your honor. I have some preliminary remarks, some disclaimers, if you will. In this video, I'm talking about bipolar disorder as well as traits generally associated with cluster B disorders, and I'm doing so knowing that there's a pretty heavy stigma attached to these disorders, and so I've done a great deal of research in order to hopefully not inadvertently add to that stigma. This video or a hypothetical diagnosis is not there to justify Dutch's behavior as it exists entirely independent of a diagnosis. What I'm saying is that no bipolar disorder or any other diagnosis didn't make Dutch do the things he does in the game. Uh, what I am saying is that considering his mental health is an interesting angle that could maybe help us understand some shifts in behavior and contextualize some of his decisions. I'm also not suggesting that Dutch was written with bipolar disorder coded into his behavior, or any other disorder for that matter. I just think it's an interesting angle to approach him from. That being said, this man could have benefited from a lithium prescription. Anyway, if Dutch had access to lithium, he would require a diagnosis to get his hands on such a thing, and to get a diagnosis, you have to meet a certain criteria. You know this. The diagnosis for bipolar is broken down into two separate but similar diagnoses, bipolar 1 and bipolar 2, as well as cyclothemia, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, but we're focusing largely on bipolar 1 in this video. Take a shot every time I say bipolar. Bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 are similar in the sense that they both experience depressive symptoms, but they differ in how severe the manic symptoms are. In order to be diagnosed with bipolar 1, an individual must experience a manic episode that lasts for at least seven days. I'll talk about mania a lot in this video, but in short, a manic episode is characterized by a sustained period of elevated or irritable mood, heightened energy, and other extreme or exaggerated behaviors. Manic episodes in severe cases can be accompanied by psychosis, which is marked by a mental separation from reality. Obviously, in the era that Dutch Vanderland was alive, the psychiatric field was in its early development, and we wouldn't have a proper diagnosis diagnosis for bipolar disorder until 1980, after much debate and a couple editions of the DSM. So it's not as though this is a diagnosis that Dutch would have received anyway, but he's a collection of pixels set in a fictional depiction of 1899 America, so I'm just gonna have a little fun. Geld him. Yeah! During the era, it's much more likely that if Dutch did have bipolar disorder, he would have been institutionalized as that was all the rage back then, but now we're much more sophisticated and we probably would just misdiagnose him with something else and then prescribe him something and uh, see how that goes. Considering many disorders share symptoms and similar presentations, I acknowledge it's entirely possible that Dutch could have a different or comorbid diagnosis as I myself don't even think bipolar is an entirely uh, comprehensive diagnosis, but we don't have all day. Especially considering I'm building this bipolar 1 diagnosis around what I perceive to be a manic episode, mania is prevalently associated with bipolar, but not exclusive. It's also present in schizoaffective disorder, seasonal affective disorder, as well as many of the traits of mania being easily confused for symptoms of BPD or NPD. You'll find that now that I have more than three minutes, I have a lot of qualifying remarks. So anyway, I'm using Hosea, Arthur, and John as what I call grounding perspectives, as in they don't have any perceived manic or psychotic symptoms and they're familiar with Dutch for over a decade. So I'm utilizing their perspectives on the situation and on Dutch as objective as I don't necessarily trust Dutch as a reliable source. 
for anything but much less objectivity. During a first playthrough, it can be easy to look at Dutch in chapters 5 and 6 and go, whoa, this guy's not okay especially from the perspective of a player who's either forgotten the events of Red Dead 1 over the course of a several year gap or someone who hasn't played it at all to begin with. I think it's easy to overlook some of the subtle nuances in his behavior from chapters 1 and 2. We're thrown into the midst of a crisis where every character is shaken up and not just Dutch and so it's easy to overlook some paranoid behavior or some defensive behavior directed towards characters you would think you would have an unwavering trust towards, like Arthur. Arthur, however, before the events of the game have even started, seems to be noticing that something is off about Dutch. In order to keep us on task, something I could benefit greatly from, I've prepared a lovely little symptom board. And every time we collect a new symptom of Bipolar 1, we'll put it on our lovely little symptom board, and then we can, I don't know, diagnose him or something. We'll come back to her later. Anywho, come snoop through Mr. Morgan's diary with me, will you? Welcome to the reading corner, wherein we're going to read Arthur Morgan's journal. This is not his journal, these are... These are my notes. In Arthur's journal, there's a section written prior to the Blackwater Ferry job and the subsequent disaster that follows, and in it, we can kind of get a glimpse into what Dutch was like leading up to that job. Before the job had even been considered, it sounds as though there was plans to settle down with the gang, but according to Arthur, Dutch pulled out of that plan and they press on as outlaws, I guess. Dutch had a lead for some land and we were going to buy, but the land did not match up to his criteria, or he got spooked we were being watched by the law and somebody knew who he was and we never bought it. A common experience for many of us, but especially those dealing with bipolar disorder, is self-sabotage, wherein we block ourselves from achieving a goal. For those with bipolar disorder, self-sabotage is often a manifestation of impulsive behaviors and anxiety. Arthur's lack of clarity over why they didn't go through with this plan, whether it was because it didn't meet a criteria or someone was watching them, leads me to believe that there wasn't really a solid reason given in the first place. As I'll get into a lot in this video, Dutch is pretty prone to paranoia. What's this? A, a symptom? Oh, a symptom board. Board, a symptom on the symptom board. We're not gonna dwell on this for too long because, like I said, I'm, I'm gonna talk about paranoia a lot. <laughs> so much, actually. Like, so much, guys. Anyway, it could be argued that his belief that they were being watched could be founded in reality. After all, they are outlaws committing crimes. One could suggest that people were indeed after them for that. However, Arthur doesn't seem to be concerned over that, so... And then in discussing the planning for the Blackwater Ferry job, Arthur writes, Dutch seems happy and excited. He's talking again about California, but he's also talking about a lot of other places. This could very well just be general excitement about the prospect of a big score. However, given the way Dutch frequently gets wrapped up in big jobs without thinking about the end consequences, talking about lots of places, this could read as increased talkativeness, distractibility, and even an elevated mood. Though this is before anything's really kicked off, so I don't want to get ahead of myself here. So now that we're caught up with what little info we have to help us contextualize what Dutch's mental state may have been leading up to and during the Blackwater Ferry job, we can move into chapter one. I figured analyzing Dutch in a chronological order would make the most sense to help us see the progression of what I believe to be a manic episode. It seems that even in these early chapters, prior to chapter one even, Dutch is already in a kind of vulnerable mental state maybe. As a player, we get our first real glimpse into Dutch as a character through his opening monologue where he's rallying the troops to stay strong. During this monologue, Dutch spends a lot of time talking about himself and then also makes sure to emphasize that the gang stays with him. Stay strong. Stay with me. Right after that, in the same mission, Dutch reflexively refers to himself before correcting himself very quickly. Get indoors, son! I... We need you strong. If this were an isolated situation, I'd shrug it off as Dutch merely being scrambled for the situation they're in, which would make sense, but it's not. I feel these behaviors could be indicative of grandiosity, which you guessed it is a symptom of mania, a requirement for bipolar one, new symptom alert. A very loose definition of grandiosity brought to you by wikipedia.com, the most reliable source. In psychology, grandiosity is a sense of superiority, uniqueness, or invulnerability. It may be expressed by exaggerated beliefs regarding one's abilities, the belief that few people have anything in common with oneself, and that one can only be understood by a few, very special people. The personality trait of grandiosity is principally associated with narcissistic personality disorder, but is also a feature in the occurrence and expression of antisocial personality disorder and the manic and hypomanic episodes of bipolar disorder. And Dutch, whether intentionally or not, has become a leader to several people, and I believe this reality could compound uniquely with his exaggerated sense of self, wherein he commonly forgets that several people are relying on someone like Charles 
not just him. As Outlaws from the West draws to a close, Dutch mentions that he hasn't slept for three days, and only just now is he showing really any indication of this. Though I don't necessarily think Dutch is experiencing a full-blown manic episode by this point, I do think that if he were a real man in 2023 with a bipolar diagnosis and he went into a psychiatrist's office, they might quirk their eyebrow and up his meds or something. Beyond a possible uptick in energy and some subtle grandiosity, Dutch is also displaying some symptoms of paranoia again in Chapter 1. Despite the fact that the O'Driscolls were just as surprised to see Dutch Vanderland at Sadie Adler's ranch as he was to see them. O'Driscolls? I don't believe it. It's a strange one, all right. Maybe they're hiding up here, too. There's a big price on Colm O'Driscoll's head. Nearly as big as the one on yours. A mere day later, Dutch seems to have it in his head that Como Driscoll and his goons are in the mountains for him specifically, and they are going to bushwhack them. What is he basing this on? <sighs> mm. You sure about this, Dutch? Yes. Both been through a lot recently. We hardly back on our feet yet. And the last thing we need is to get bushwhacked by Como Driscoll. Let's go. I know you hate him, Dutch. He's here for us. I doubt that. No, you're just doubting me. Already, Dutch is growing defensive when he's not aligned with, even when his ideas sound a little strange. Why would the O'Driscolls be on the mountain for Dutch? Why is that an assumption he would even make? They were at Sadie Adler's ranch for three days before Arthur, Micah, and Dutch came upon them, and they're only up there because they made a mad dash from the law from Blackwater. For Dutch to make the immediate leap that they're there specifically for him is a pretty large leap. My camera died and I just realized the ring light wasn't on. Uh, sorry, I'm sure you were really enjoying not seeing that reflection in my glasses, but unfortunately, the lighting was bad, and I'm sorry. Paranoia in general is not something that every person with bipolar disorder experiences, but many people are impacted by it. In severe cases of mania, an individual might experience hallucinations or delusions, and for an individual with bipolar disorder, this may manifest as I've tried to pronounce this so many times. Persecutor. 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 I can't do it. I'm sorry. Persecutor. Hmm. That's a tough one. Persecutor. I'm not going to try. We'll put it here. Basically, these are delusions wherein an individual believes that people are out to get them or to persecute them, so on, so forth. You get the idea. I believe for Dutch, this manifest says the idea that Colmel Driscoll and his gang are here with concerted effort against Dutch specifically in this moment, despite the fact that it's very clear that they're here with a planned robbery. What are you bastards doing? Why are you up here? Uh, we're fixing to rob some train. Gonna blow the tracks. I don't know more than that, I swear. <laughs> well, I would say it looks like you have this, Arthur. Of course, this could just be Dutch attempting to dishonestly justify pursuing robbery plans despite vocalized concerns from Jose and Arthur. However, I believe the fact that he would pursue a robbery during this time, despite the very valid concerns, is indicative of another symptom. You heard it here first, folks. A new symptom on the board. Impulsive or risky behavior. We are going to talk about this so much. Part of the reason I'm inclined towards bipolar disorder as a diagnosis for Dutch is because it's marked by periods where an individual would be seemingly well-adjusted, not experiencing depression or mania, at least on a level where it's perceivable to others. Because of this, it could be rationalized that these level periods are why people like Hosea and Arthur stick around despite the fact that some of Dutch's behavior is growing to be more confusing by the day. It's possible that in past, Dutch would become hypomanic and then level out again in the future, which would cause people to characterize this cyclical shift in his behavior as just the way Dutch is. These periods of heightened irritability or a lack of sleep are just how Dutch gets, and they'll always level out eventually and they just kind of ignore it until it becomes too glaring of a problem to ignore. Up a change number two for chapter two not just because it's another day. Going into chapter two, we as the player don't really get a whole lot of time in mission with Dutch. He kind of keeps to camp for the most of the chapter. If we snoop through Arthur's journal again, he writes, Dutch seems a little better. His eyes are sparkling once more, and I can see he's thinking a little clearer. I think this kind of speaks to the idea that Arthur was noticing something was off with Dutch even prior to this chapter, um, but with some newfound stability in a new camp, 
he might be feeling a little more grounded. As I mentioned before, we as the player don't get a whole bunch of time with Dutch in this chapter, and so I think, especially for our first time player engaging with Dutch for the first time, this can easily put us in the position of someone like Javier or Bill. Despite playing as Arthur, we don't have the 20 years of history and experience with Dutch to really understand him as a character fully at this point. For once, Dutch is following the sage advice of laying low, and so he sticks around camp for the most of the chapter, and so if you as the player are gallivanting around the map, as one naturally Really would. It's really easy to miss some of the red flags in Dutch's behavior in this chapter. Anyway, if you hang around camp enough, you'll catch some interactions with Dutch that might shine a light on his shaky mental state. Many of the times he stops Arthur, he'll patter on about philosophy or Evelyn Miller, or he'll accuse him of stalking him or plotting to betray him. You're stalking me too, Arthur. I expect you'll betray me in the end, Arthur. You're the type. Again, the betrayal specifically feels indicative of the persecutor- persec- the delusions wherein he believes he's being persecuted. Because both of these do not feel grounded in reality by any measure. Also, after he accuses Arthur of plotting to betray him, he'll- <sighs> He claims he's a little tired. <laughs> what is that even supposed to mean? I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a little tired, I think. It makes you wonder if he's been sleeping particularly well. Especially when Arthur comes to Dutch after being cornered at the river with Jack by a couple of Pinkerton agents who tell him just how much trouble they're really in, and Dutch decides his best course of action is... I say we do nothing. And it might be hindsight bias, but this seems like a point where they should have considered moving. Not after being confronted by Leviticus Cornwall in public. Vandalin! Though Dutch doesn't seem to see the active threat at this point, despite how much it initially worried Arthur, rightly so. In fact, Arthur seems frequently worried about the positions that Dutch is haplessly putting them in, and if you recall earlier, Arthur is one of our grounding perspectives. As we move into chapter 3, Dutch seems a little more chipper and a little less interested in lying low. We have lofty goals, Arthur. We're trying to reform society to a kinder, truer, better way. Now, of course, there's gonna be casualties. We're thieves in a world that don't want us no more. We are dreamers in an ever duller world of facts. Now, I'll give you that, but come on! Keep in mind what I said about grounding perspectives here. Dutch removed of his colorful language about dreamers and reforming the world just isn't giving grounded in reality, from the way he so casually brushes off those who died to discussions of their lofty goals and, oh, what's this? A new symptom? Yes, that's right. Many people who experience mania might feel a little more inspired than usual. In many cases, people might have large-scale ideas and report feeling a little more goal-directed than usual, and this can create quite a potent mix when it's interacting with other symptoms of mania like impulsivity but we'll discuss that later. Toward the end of the mission, the New South, Dutch seems to brush off some warnings from Josiah Trelawney about some bounty hunters in the area, and then seems really pleased that they're ingratiated with the local law. And once again, this could just be hindsight bias, but given their current circumstances, it seems strange to even want the local law to know what they look like. But then Dutch takes it a step further and decides they should be deputized, and let's correspond with our grounding perspective. You have finally lost your mama. You heard it here first, folks. Even Molly seems to think something is up with Dutch. How is Dutch? I mean, how does he seem to you? I'm about the same as usual, I guess. I... I really love him, you know. But if he... Like he always says, loyalty is everything, so... Arthur! Oh my god, get the fuck! Anyway, while this question obviously could have been fueled by the shift in the relationship separate of any behavior that Molly might have noticed in Dutch, I don't necessarily think that the shift in the relationship is isolated from Dutch's hypothetical hypomania, as many people with bipolar disorder report having relationship issues. Alright, it's time to talk about risk-taking behavior again, as we're getting to the point where Dutch thinks it's a good idea to rob both the Braithwaite's and the Greys. So what are you boys thinking? We try to rob them both. Arthur seems perturbed by this plan, but as you might have noticed, he's in his doormat era and just kind of lets Dutch do what he pleases without much pushback. And now that Mike is getting in his ear, trying to align himself strategically with the influence in the gang, I don't know, let's pay attention to that. During chapter two, there's a couple camp interactions where Michael will get in Dutch's ear. I'm just 
an old outlaw not prepared to go quietly. Oh, you're more than that, Dutch. You're... You're... Well, you're amazing. What the hell is up with him? He must be after something. And while at first it seems that Dutch will see right through this and is resistant to it, as time goes on and Dutch starts showing more perceivable manic symptoms, he seems to warm up to Micah's faux flattery. Enter blessed are the peacemakers! <laughs> now this mission could be cast with a broad net of risk-taking impulsive behavior, but clearly things go a little deeper than that here. It's a trap! Well, of course, it's probably a trap, but what do we got to lose finding out? Get shot. I don't see the point in any of this. Let's go. You and me, with Arthur protecting us, no one else. And I'll be honest, this behavior is confusing. I think in this instance, using a potential diagnosis helps us understand behavior and also fill in the gaps where things are even weirder. I'm not terribly confused by Dutch going to meet Colm. The reasons given seem like things he would logically believe to be true and also the potential to have it out with a nemesis if things do turn out to be a trap seem reason enough for Dutch. Where the confusion comes in is after the fact. Dutch abandons Arthur after telling him he would meet him on the road. However this shakes out, let's aim to meet back at the fork in the road afterwards. We'll be there, partner. Only when Arthur returns to camp after battling for his life and just barely making it out, there's like not a single sign that anyone even knew he was missing. Arthur. Arthur? Arthur. It's just kind of weird. It's strange behavior. After the fact, Dutch is seemingly apologetic, and whether or not that's sincere is hard to tell and up for debate, but he seems to be able to tell that he made a mistake here. And son, I'm sorry. I feel like a fool. <sighs> I'm alive. Yeah, well, it seemed like a good opportunity. Micah and I both feel like idiots. I feel an element of distractibility could be at play here because while we understand where Dutch and Arthur's relationship ends up and we naturally want to look at the scenario through the lens of betrayal, I find it hard to believe that at this point in the narrative, Dutch would knowingly and willingly abandon Arthur like that. I just don't think at this point Dutch has any strategic plans to remove Arthur. It, it just doesn't seem to make sense with the way the narrative is happening at the moment. Here's how I imagine the conversation between Dutch and Micah going after they met with Colm and are waiting for Arthur on the road. He said he'd be here. Ah, you know old cowpoke probably went off to go sketch a tulip or something. Oh, feels strange, don't it? But, uh, maybe you're right. Course I'm right, boss. You know Arthur. He's a tough guy. Let's just meet him back at camp. Yeah, uh, you're right. Let's go! Don't everyone rush to the comments now to tell me how impressive my impressions of Dutch and Micah are. I know. I feel Dutch shows signs of being easily put onto new paths with very little hesitation and even less consideration. I mean, if he can make major decisions like going to meet Colm or robbing a Cornwall train on a mere whim, I can only imagine how easily it would be for him to merely leave a road. Even robbing two plantation families in the same town was a decision he made on the basis of Why not? Also, maybe we should check in on how that's going. Yeah, what don't feel right? I could have told you. <laughs> My goddamn son! My sons gave him to Angelo Bronte. Hey Dutch, we got a problem. Not a problem. Visitor. Yikes, that sure looks like a lot of stress to manage in a mere I I don't know, like 24 hours. Especially if you're say hypomanic. Mania can be triggered or exacerbated by stress, so I think from now on we should uh, keep an eye on the stress levels, uh, probably. This might explain why it feels like there's a major uptick in Dutch's impulsivity moving into chapter 4, even prior to the major event that I will inevitably have to discuss. Anyway, despite the fact that Jack has literally been kidnapped and they have no idea about his whereabouts or his status of well-being, Dutch is actually pretty chill about this whole thing. Stick him up, cowboy. <laughs> I know Jack is fine. You know Jack is fine. They d do not. Uh, yeah, real funny, Dutch. Oh, I thought so. John and Arthur seem to grasp the severity of this, as one might hope that John would. 
But when I assess my grounding perspectives and then I look over at Dutch, who is, um... <laughs> Dutch Vanderlyn, uh, Arthur Morgan. Arthur, uh, the pleasure is mine. John Marston. <laughs> All mine, please. Dutch takes to Bronte almost immediately and seems to think they have some kind of shared allegiance because they're both in the business of crime or something. I don't know, I couldn't tell you. I don't know what about this man exactly screams trustworthy to Dutch other than maybe... You twist words, you lie shamelessly. You think you are better than everyone else. Diodoro. <laughs> that is the best woman <laughs> Angelo Bronte. Hmm. Has anyone heard from Kieran lately? Ooh, uh oh. Well, that's pr uh, that's probably not good for the stress levels. Um, I'm sure it's fine, actually. We need to leave forever. We've been doing well, making money, but for us all to leave together, we need enough for a boat. Now, I found a friendly ship captain. He's willing to take us to Australia or Tahiti. We just need to pay for passage and give him money for land when we get there. No questions asked. We will disappear. Be reborn. Okay, so I have some thoughts and some uh, some questions and some concerns here. You mean to tell me that Dutch found a man with a boat that can accommodate 20 people and he's willing to take them to Australia or Tahiti and he will take them there, no questions asked, as long as they pay him for land of which he has access to in either of these places uh, somehow. How does Dutch know that he's not just gonna drop them off there and then be like, well, Good luck, which seems more likely to me. Now they're outlaws in a country with no money, no land. Even if they did have money, it wouldn't even be in the right currency, probably, so. Also, is it just me or does Dutch sound like he's talking a little more rapidly than usual? It ain't the time for doubting. Otherwise, Mac, Jenny, all of them, they died for nothing. We are gonna leave this place, and we are gonna find our own paradise, our own heaven, Tahiti, Fiji, Australia, the real new world. I don't know, it sounds a little scattered if you ask me. It might be confirmation bias, but I'm right. Anyway, I just, I just want to touch base here. Um, maybe look at the symptom board. Talk about the stress levels, maybe. Have a little intermission uh, discussion here. So at this point, um, yeah, um, he's feeling the stress. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna step into, into Dutch's shoes. Or his, his boots, rather. Okay, so I, I'm a gang leader, and there's like... 20 people in this gang or something, and uh, that's a lot of pressure. And also, I'm wanted for um, a lot of money or something, so that's probably not good. Uh, pro also, and I just recently robbed a train against uh, the the wishes and concerns of my most trusted associates. Also, uh, like, Five gang members have died on my watch now. Also, me and my right-hand man just mega botched a robbery in the town over and a kid got kidnapped, but he's fine probably. His kidnapper, however, dope dude, cool guy, nothing strange about him. In fact, I'm gonna take him up on this robbery tip right now. What do you mean it was a setup? There's almost nothing here. There should be stacks of cash in there. He told us there was, look again. There's no stacks, a few dollars and coins, that's it. Damn! We got a problem! There's a ton of cops out there! I'm being so serious, I don't understand how he could not have seen this coming had it not been for something already clouding his judgment. Grounding perspective. That's greasy son of a bitch, he set us up, you think? Thank you, Arthur, that's what I also think. Okay, okay guys, listen, I'm gonna be so normal about this. If you've come for my TikTok, you'll know how I feel about this. So I will save you the rant. So Dutch uh, bumps his head. Dutch. Okay, so I, it's probably a concussion, uh, pro uh, probably. I don't feel so good. Now you just got a bash on the head. Uh, admittedly, this does not uh, sound good. Uh, he's in rough shape. Um, 
You know what's so interesting though is that it's been suggested that there's a correlational relationship between traumatic brain injuries and bipolar disorder. According to my very scholarly source, psychcentral.com, um, some bipolar symptoms may become intensified following a concussion. Not to mention how many symptoms of a traumatic brain injury and bipolar disorder overlap, like changes in sleep patterns, irritability, or even depression. The next we see Dutch after Lenny takes him home, there's a distinct uptick in his irritability, and his speech seems even more erratic than prior. Have some goddamn faith! I am bending over backwards to make a future for us! I know, but... But! 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 When did you become so small-minded? Micah is the only one left with any loyalty. Now, that ain't fair. You are talking like John. I swear that woman is poisoning him against me. I've seen it before. You think Micah would question going after Bronte? No. He'd say, let's go. I'm here, ain't I? I've been at your side for 20 years. I know. I... Also, that's a weird note about John being poisoned against him. Based on what? He's barely talked to John since they got Jack back. I don't know where this is stemming from, but I'm inclined to call it paranoia. Paranoia can be a symptom of a traumatic brain injury. However, it's pretty rare, and we've seen Dutch be paranoid before this. I imagine his paranoia could have been exacerbated by this probable concussion, much like his agitation or aggression. Filth has got to be disposed oh! of! Friends of Pinkerton's gonna come and rescue you, you repulsive little maggot! Um, uh, so that's probably not normal behavior for a Dutch uh, given uh, this reaction. I'm sure I'm not the first person to make this comparison, but I imagine this to be similar to how he behaved in the Heidi McCourt situation, murdering her in a blind rage following a major stressor and high pressure. Now, I want to be so clear about my point here. It is not the murder in this instance that is causing me to think that something symptomatic is going on, as I don't want to imply that people with bipolar disorder or other psychotic disorders are prone to violent murders. What I am saying is that Dutch and those around him live a rather violent lifestyle, and murder something that they all do uh, all the time. None of my grounding perspectives are not murderers, so I want to make it clear, not the, it's not the murder. John and Arthur having a reaction to this specific murder, or Heidi McCourt's, is notable to me. Dutch set out to kill Bronte from the beginning, so I don't think anyone was terribly surprised that Dutch killed Bronte. That's not the shocking part here. I do believe that killing Bronte was a calculated move, and whether or not it was well thought out is up for debate and not the point, but I don't believe the aggression in which he did it with was calculated. His concussion, coupled with him potentially growing more and more manic by the day, could have triggered an impulsive bout of aggression. I believe that something similar, high stress minus the head trauma, could have triggered the murder of Heidi McCourt, as I'm reminded of how Javier discusses it with Arthur. We had the money, it seemed fine, and suddenly they were everywhere. Bounty hunters? No, Pinkertons. It was crazy. Raining bullets. Dutch killed a girl in a bad way. But it was a bad situation. That ain't like him, though. Why don't we check out the stress levels? Uh, keep, an, keep an eyeball. Oh, that's not good. I'm gonna be honest, guys. That's not good. That's, uh, that no. Yeah, we can fix this. You know what? Get him away from the drama. Get him some rest. Don't! Jose, we lost John. Killed? Arrested. We can get across here! You goddamn sh- Oh, God, no! I got it. A boat. That cloud look like good news to you. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's... It's not good. <laughs> okay, so it looks bad. It, let's just take stock. We've got, um, a probable head trauma. Hosea dies. Lenny dies. Uh, John gets arrested, uh, the boat, uh, the boat, uh, it sinks, they get separated from Arthur, and uh, maybe, I don't know, he probably thinks he's dead for a day at least. Um, and then, uh, plus Blackwater, and Cornwall, and Mac, and Davy, Sean, Kieran. So what's our ground, what's, uh, what's the grounding perspective have to say? An insect bite you or something? Cause you gone, friend. Oh no, he's having persecutory delusions again. So what happened with John in that bank? 
He survived. The only one they took alive. Why is that, you think? And Abigail, I presume she was able to slip away in time. Pain now. Yeah, and, and there he goes with the aggression and... Oh, Dutch. That's not necessary. We don't... Oh, man. I, um... Guys, maybe, um, guys, maybe we should just institutionalize this guy. I'll lock him up. Lobotomize him. I'm kidding. Okay. I, I um, I think, let's take a, let's take a break. Let's, um, I'm gonna take a walk. I need a little intermission. I think I'm getting a little silly. So obviously going into chapter 5, Dutch is in a, a vulnerable state, uh, mentally speaking. I think it's reasonable to assume that he probably thought Arthur had died, given he exclaims, You're alive! when Arthur arrives on Guarma. You're alive. Arthur! No you're, you're alive! <laughs> okay. Here's a miracle! After everything in San Denis, Dutch seems vaguely unhinged, but remains very directed. He has a clear plan of action that's very clear to him, but is sounding crazy to Arthur. Get everybody together and get ourselves back on course. Where would that be? Place we just escaped from. <laughs> you want to go back to San Denis? If it was you got left, you'd want us to go back. I'd want it, but I wouldn't expect that's it. That's the point. Ain't no one gonna expect it. An insect bite you or something, cause you gone, friend. He's seemingly unfazed by what's happened, so much so that he hardly reacts to the mention of Hosea. Bunch of penniless fugitives on some Caribbean dump, sneaking through caves while two of our best men got shot back home. How could I doubt you, Dutch? You got no idea, Arthur. He begins to ramble on about John and Abigail conspiring against him, and then suddenly murders a woman. Jesus! I used to assume that Dutch murdered this woman because he wanted to take back the gold that he gave her to take them through these tunnels. But he doesn't retrieve any gold. He simply murders her. Shall we proceed? I guess. Dutch quickly tries to defend himself by offering some kind of flimsy reasoning, but he contradicts himself, like, moments later. Who's gonna betray us, Arthur? Couldn't you tell? No. Well, I got some Spanish. She was. So how did you know she was gonna betray us? What'd she say? It was in her eyes, in the way she was leading us. But you said you knew Spanish. While it could be suggested that he's lying as a defense, it could also be suggested that with how often Dutch is cited as uh, finding harmful intent in others, including in this mission, over someone he's known a decade long, it could be argued he believes that she was going to betray them. Hey, do you guys think fighting in a civil war is good for stress? You just watching there, Morgan? By the time chapter five is wrapping up, Dutch has a very clear goal in mind. He's set on survival. I will kill for my family. Any of you want to judge me for that? That's fine, but that is who I am. Anyone disagree? It becomes very apparent through the progression of the narrative that Dutch is very comfortable doing some not-so-cool things if it means that he is going to survive the situation that he put himself in. Okay, so listen guys, I'm not even gonna make a joke. They get back and like immediately are ambushed by Pinkerton agents and they have a Gatling gun, so the stress levels are not good. And you can tell immediately following, because Dutch can hardly form a sentence. We just need some time. I just, I, I need some time. Now, we can't go east, because then we'll be in the ocean, so we're gonna have to go north, I guess. Dutch is speaking rapidly and stumbling over himself, and one could suggest that anyone would be rattled given the stress and the pressure, and I admit this is true, but I need someone to explain all this. Two. Black. What are you doing? By someone I mean me because I'm making the video actually, so. There's a couple things that I think Dutch's behavior could be indicative of, and I don't think they're necessarily related to head trauma at this point, or the symptoms of a traumatic brain injury. I do believe that the initial head trauma absolutely exacerbated symptoms of mania, but I don't think there's anything about his current behavior that indicates he has lingering symptoms of head trauma that couldn't be better explained by symptoms of mania. I think this makes more sense because he shows a lot of these symptoms prior to the fated crash. Dutch is speaking rapidly, not thinking clearly, and he grows quite agitated when someone pushes him for answers on something that he doesn't have an answer to. 
or he doesn't like the answer for. We're back, and I'm sitting here, and I am contemplating the great journey of the sun and considering a famous chess move. Those oily enactors of a mediocre justice, the pressing millionaire Leviticus Cornwall, they want us, Arthur. They want us. And they are going to have us. Maybe they ain't the problem. Meaning? It's also clear that by this point, Dutch is really feeling the loss of Hosea. You sound like Hosea. I miss him. But I don't think that if Hosea was around, there's really any salvaging this situation. Because let's be honest, there wasn't really much interest on Dutch's end in listening to Hosea most of the time anyway. Maybe he could have gotten some of the others out before things had gotten quite so dire, but I really believe that Guarma put Dutch in a mental state that he doesn't have the resources to come back from. While Dutch seems very assured of what the current goal is and what needs to be done, our only available grounding perspective is a whole lot less sure. I can't help but feel we would have been better running off someplace else. <laughs> but the the game ain't over, Arthur. I mean, I ain't, I ain't played my, my final move, but... I guess I'm more interested in saving lives than winning a chess. And maybe life ain't such a thing to cling on to so tightly, no doubt. And Sadie notices, too. What happened to Dutch? Because he seems... I don't know. Seems as... What began happening in Blackwater began happening years ago, maybe slow decline, I guess. And I really want to talk about what Arthur says here, because he repeats it again later, and it's a sentiment that John also shares himself. Dutch ain't himself right now. Or maybe he just ain't who we thought he was. You see a man whose character changed. I see a man who got found out for who he truly was. I think this echoes the idea I had posed earlier about Dutch showing signs of mental decline earlier within the past decade plus that Arthur and John had known him, but he would always level out eventually. Oh, Dutch! Did you miss me? I found her drunk in San Denis. Now, all things considered, I feel that Molly's death likely lightened the stress levels here. I'm kidding. Maybe, I don't know. I think it's clear that Dutch isn't terribly torn up over her death, but I do find it interesting that he hesitated in killing her himself. You're not afraid me! What? You calm down. Arthur, ah. you- Damn! <laughs> that being said, it really kicks chapter six off in, um... Uh. Yeah, um... Yeah, the vibes are bad. At this point, it becomes explicitly clear that Micah is a problem, not to insinuate he wasn't before, but now that Dutch is in a less than lucid place, it's concerning that he's much more susceptible to Micah's manipulation tactics. As mentioned earlier, prior to chapter four, Dutch seems to see right through Micah, but as he descends further into what I perceive to be mania, his ability to discern the risk where Micah is concerned is slowly diminished until Micah becomes his number two. He specifically plays to Dutch's paranoias and delusions about traitors and rats. The main reason for this, I think, is because we're watching Micah strategically position himself for his own personal gain. He's operating with selfish intent, and he's smart enough to see the vulnerabilities in the gang. This makes a really volatile concoction where Micah's able to rile Dutch up over his paranoia and possible delusions to distract from the fact that he himself is working with the Pinkertons. A shock to nobody, but Dutch, apparently. He validates Dutch, and because of this Dutch is more likely to keep him close while pushing away people like John and Arthur because they know him and are more likely to question his out-of-character behavior. One could deduce that Micah is the one leading the charge here, and while I believe that's partly true, Dutch does still resist direction from Micah unless it aligns with his personal goals. Way I see it, best thing we can do is let the week go. Move on, get her money, and start over. That ain't happening. Micah is able to talk Dutch into dangerous plans like going to see Cornwall and Annisburg, as pursuing vengeance is not out of character for Dutch and he sees personal value in eliminating Cornwall. Guys, I cannot continue to be serious about how unhinged Dutch has become by this point. I'll tell you what. You give me this ship, $10,000, and safe passage out of here, I'll let you live. Uh. I know it's bait for Cornwall to say no because... Good. I prefer it this way. And I'm sure that will have no further consequences on the gang. Um, grounding perspective. You lost your man. Yeah, well, we're in agreement there. Because I need for him to explain to me why the Pinkerton Detective Agency would stop pursuing him and this case because he... 
murdered Leviticus Cornwall in broad daylight. <laughs> I understand that his logic is that if Cornwall isn't there, he can't fund the investigation and then subsequent chase. But Dutch, if we think about this plan for any longer than 0.3 seconds, how would it not just result in more pressure from law enforcement? Interestingly, Dutch is pretty indifferent about the possibility of the law coming down on them for him murdering Leviticus Cornwall in broad daylight in the middle of a mining town, but not Arthur breaking John out of prison. No, no, no. And when Spring and John brings the law down on all of us, what then, Arthur? I had a goddamn plan! Arthur going behind Dutch's back to break John out of prison against his wishes may also feel like a confirmation of some of those paranoid feelings about betrayal. Of course, from any rational standpoint, we know it's not a betrayal, but I'm talking about Dutch Vanderland, and I've been discussing the possibility of him having bipolar disorder and being manic for... four days. In fact, let's take a break to talk about a symptom that I haven't discussed yet, and it's often described as the flight of ideas, or feeling highly inspired, having great plans. Frequently, Dutch will rattle off some plan. Fiji! Australia! The real! New world! Not this godforsaken dump that all of Europe's detritus has acted out its peasants' vengeance on! We are gonna be free! We're gonna take the money. Listen, all of you. We are gonna take the money and go to paradise. Let the Pinkertons arrest some other fools. New York. We are gonna go to New York. Now, they have been chasing us south and east and west. We're gonna get a boat, we're gonna get on a river, and we're gonna go north. New York. Then Tahiti, the Fiji Islands, or this place, New Guinea. And while I have definitely touched on all these instances, and we've touched briefly on bipolar people feeling a little more uh, inspired when they're manic, I haven't concretely discussed the idea that when they're discussing these plans, it can feel like nonsense. But first we have to make a whole lot of smoke, a whole lot of commotion, and then we disappear. We need more commotion? One score and one whole hell of a lot of noise. These plans lack a lot of thought and planning. He's very dead set on the idea of escaping and freedom, only he's caught up in this cycle of biting off more than he can chew in terms of heists, which only set him further and further back. One could deduce that the chase of it all is what Dutch is really after, but that's probably an entirely separate video altogether. <laughs> anyway, his newest plan is interrupted when Eagle Flies comes to speak to Arthur, and Dutch immediately leaps at the opportunity to get involved, as he seems to think he can use this situation to his advantage. We need to move towards a conclusion now. Sure, but what's this got to do with any of that? Some good, honest conflict between the army and the Indians might be just the distraction we need. At this point, Arthur makes pretty consistent remarks about Dutch's nonsensical behavior and his new plan. What's his new plan, you ask? Uh, um, exacerbating genocide? Alright, that's a little extreme and reductive. Not really. But the plan is basically to create a bunch of major distractions in the area and then attempt to shift blame to the local indigenous population as they're in an ongoing conflict with the American government at the time, um, and Dutch feels he can use this to his personal benefit. Yikes. Now, I am not insinuating that Dutch's callous disregard for ethics and human rights is at all related to bipolar disorder. What I am saying is it took next to nothing to get him involved here, and despite warnings, Dutch seems to double down on this plan. What do you think, Charles? You know I told your father I will not fight over some horses. But I made no such promise. Come along. And to Dutch's benefit, this plan might have worked had it not been for Micah collaborating with the Pinkerton agents. However, it's a hell of a risk, and not only that, it seems to misalign with his morals, and this is the major crux of the conflict between him and the rest of the gang. That, and it's also, like, objectively unhinged. <laughs> seem to be going pretty fast, Dutch. I'm trying. We're headed to those rocks. Hold on! and I'm sure that had a lot of thought put behind it. I wanna talk about camp interactions really quickly. These can be really easy to miss if you don't spend a lot of time around camp, which can be 
easy to do during chapter six, but I truly think these are the moments where we see Dutch in his rawest form sometimes. Something I noticed is that often during the night you can see Dutch awake in his tent, and it's just speculation, but Dutch isn't exactly giving well rested. He's giving unhinged and erratic. They won't catch me. They won't catch me. You don't want to be the general. You don't have the grit. You dumb fool. Money. Oh, we are dead. We are all dead. I got this. I got this. How did the Pinkertons know about the bank job in San Denis, John? You want to tell me that? Don't lose faith. That is the one thing I can't bear. Some real interesting speech patterns, um, some distractibility, a lot of grandiosity, and those paranoid delusions are back. And he spends a lot of time defending what I believe he believes is his version of reality. Uh, John, Arthur, what do, wh what do we reckon? I feel like I just don't know Dutch no more. You ain't the only one. And this... The man may have lost it, but he's still feeling silly, it seems. Time to tar and feather the army, I guess. You have energy for pranks? Guys, I get that he has nefarious goals, but how did he think this was gonna go? Did he think that the army would just be like, Ah, oh, drat, you darn indigenous folk, you. You got us this time, but we'll, we'll get you next time. I know that his goal is to drum up conflict, but how did he think that he was getting out of this? I also don't think he anticipated this level of a response. Arthur sure did, though. Well, that went just about according to plan. I'm trying. I'm trying, Arthur, with everything I have, and I will keep trying, and you'll keep doubting me, and we'll keep failing. It ain't like that, Dutch. Look at me. Look at me! I'm just... I'm worried about folk. I know. I... So Dutch seems a touch distractible right now, but plot armor to the rescue. <laughs> also, it could be a reach, but I feel that his ability to escape situations like this by the skin of his teeth could affirm some of those feelings of grandiosity, um, you know, feeling larger than life and untouchable, which fuels his impulsivity and lack of causal thinking. Anyway, the people are concerned. I'm... I'm very nervous. Very worried. Fräulein. Very, very worried. The Reverend left Arthur. He left me a note. Told me I should do the same. Worried. Really worried. I'm scared, Miss Grimshaw. What's Dutch thinking? I don't know. But I'd like to do Mike an injury. <laughs> you and me both. I get why you folks is worried. I do. And I cannot say I blame them, especially when his idea of a plan involves destroying the local infrastructure and then triggering a dispute against the wishes of like literally everybody with a brain. Okay, that's mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> what I mean to say is anyone with a genuine frame of reference for what is considered rational behavior from Dutch. Anyone who's known the man longer than five years and has a relationship that extends beyond just gang members seems to be worried about Dutch and then anyone with a brain as well. And I wish I could say Dutch takes his foot off the gas at some point, uh, but he doesn't. In fact, he floors it. Run! Dutch patters on and on about keeping faith in him, something that matters quite deeply to him, to the point where he makes it quite clear that aligning with him will save you his wrath, but challenging him will only get you one thing. I need help! You left me! You left me to die! It's clear that Dutch is attempting to remove obstacles, whether it's through his aggressive behavior at camp or quite literally removing the obstacle by abandoning those who challenge him, like John and Arthur. He has goals of obtaining money and escaping, and pretty much all of his energy is dumped into this. His previous ethics and morals are dwindling rapidly. Loyalty means next to nothing to him as he's prepared to turn his back on those who he cannot explain himself to. And it's frightening people. By the time our best selves rolls around, we learn that a number of people have cut loose. And I can't necessarily blame them if this is the guy at the helm. We are all dead! I am doing the best I can. All right, we've made it to the last mission and I'm running out of steam and clothing. 
but keep faith, we'll get through this. So anyway, I'm not sure if I need to continue to reiterate the point over and over again that Dutch is presenting symptoms of bipolar disorder. Ah, maybe this is a bad idea. Ah, that's a lot of people to ride into a city that you're wanted dead or alive in. Oh, maybe don't go on with the robbery when it starts not going according to plan. Oh, this has gone so poorly. Who could have seen this coming? Probably everyone but Dutch. When they return to camp post-robbery and are approached by Tilly, Dutch seems very erratic and distractible, unable to even make a decision on his own at this point, so he relies entirely on the judgment of others. Others being Micah. I am sorry to hear that. We gotta let her go. Yep. We need to keep riding on this one, Dutch. You know it. Every man here knows so we it. we just gonna let the boy be made an orphan? It ain't like that. What is it like? I wanna live, cowpoke. I still got the choice, Dutch. It's just a girl. You're right. Uh, Micah, it pains me to say it, Arthur. But he's right. Off they go. Well, these certainly don't seem like impulsive decisions that will have long-term adverse impacts on Dutch that he hasn't already considered. Anyway, Micah was the rat... Uh, what? <laughs> As a shock to nobody, but maybe Dutch, we learn that Micah was the rat, and when Arthur returns to camp about this, it, uh, goes, um... about as well as the rest of the events of the game. But what I do notice is how angry Dutch becomes when the version of reality he's been sustaining, wherein Micah is his ally, becomes challenged in a very real way. Now! Who amongst you is with me? And who is betraying me? He attempts to maintain this idea that Micah had and still has his best interest at heart, which is an idea so preposterous to literally everyone, I think that alone could count as a delusion. But of course I'm reaching here. Anyway, of course things kick off and it's all a mess and blah blah blah. I want to talk about this. I gave you all I had. In this moment, Dutch almost seems to have a moment of maybe clarity. Okay, let's back it up a bit. They tussle or whatever. Arthur's on his deathbed of rocks. Bedrock. Minecraft. Okay, I'm sorry. He's clearly grappling with a lot, and it's the quietest we've seen him in a while. He doesn't have much to say, and when all is said and done, he parts ways with Micah without a word. But this look in particular has always struck me as interesting. Dutch has effectively turned everyone against him for a man who was playing him from the get-go, and he's looking down at a man who he had a hand in raising as he dies at his feet, and it feels like he might finally get it? We don't see Dutch for another several years following the moment he stumbles off the mountain to leave Arthur to die alone, so it's anyone's guess what he's like in between then and American Venom, but when we see him, he seems a little less unhinged. Hello, son! He's of course still clinging to his version of events. He was betrayed and shot at and he was trying his best, but he's there with a clear intent. And then he hobbles off again, and all in all, he seems a little more clear-headed than when we last saw him at the end of Chapter 6. Unfortunately, this does not seem to last, as the next time we see him, it's 1911, and he's uh, murdering hostages. <laughs> so, we've clearly taken a couple steps backward there. Oh, what's outside the window? Hello, Dutch! <laughs> Dutch Vanderland. What's he want? Is that you, John? Oh, he's not here for me. You and, and, and your friend there, the professor? We're gonna kill the both of you. <laughs> Why you wanna do a thing like that? I don't know. Sport, I guess. That sounds... he sounds normal. That being said, I think John should have let them have the professor. I'm just saying. Anyway, he goes cliff diving. And that's the story of Dutch Vanderland. I'm kidding, I'll give you a proper conclusion. So let's, ju uh, let's uh, just check back in with our symptom board here. Guys, I think Dutch might have bipolar disorder. Of course, this is just an interpretation of character traits and with enough work and research, I could probably come up with 
any diagnosis within reason. And I don't necessarily think bipolar disorder is a complete diagnosis, but I don't have time. That being said, I don't feel I had to stretch too far to come to this conclusion, and I feel it can be built upon in a way that make other characters' choices surrounding Dutch make more sense. For example, Jose and Arthur being so committed to sticking by him, despite it being very clear that something is deeply clouding his judgment. Maybe they stick around because this isn't completely out of character, but by the time things have unraveled beyond a point of recovery, it's too late for anyone to get out, but especially Dutch. In a time where mental health care is next to non-existent, it would make sense that Dutch is left to continue down this descent with no intervention. Also, now that I can talk for as long as I please, I will be over-explaining myself so as to avoid being misunderstood or misconstrued because I cannot handle that. I am not using this potential mental health diagnosis to excuse Dutch for his behavior as he's still responsible for the irreparable damage he does to many people and communities, as any other character in the game would be. This is also not to say that bipolar disorder made Dutch a violent outlaw, but that having such a disorder while living such a lifestyle could create a dangerous concoction for Dutch and those around him. I am also not suggesting that people with bipolar disorder are prone to being violent, but I am suggesting that Dutch lives a violent lifestyle and that this disorder exacerbates To sum it up, I think this man could have benefited from a lithium prescription. Some mood stabilizers would have done this man a world of wonders, I reckon. So yeah, um, I'll maybe do more of these, maybe. Anyway, that's it, bye.